What's cracking? Big dogs. Welcome back to the channel. It's all business today. The weekend is over. MD dub come gone like a virgin in bed. We're getting back into our sophomore series. You know what I just realized? So we have the new setup here, right? And I feel like an official YouTuber for once in my life where I got all weird like neon things going in the bike round. That thing was a pain in my to try to figure out what frame rate we need to put the, the camera on, the aperture, the ISO, all that kind of shit. So I realized anytime I focus on something close to the camera, it blurs that really poorly. So I need to pretend I'm not from New Jersey. I need to stick my hands in between my legs and keep them down there. It's actually kind of nice because it's cold in my room. That feels good. So the longer I keep my hands down there, the greener that sign will be. Let me know how you're feeling about the new setup. So basically based off last week's video, we looked at Jonathan Taylor and we looked at CD Lamb and I said, I want to go one by one going off of the underdog fantasy ADP average draft position and see where this rookie class was going and break down, you know, the RB one and the wide receiver one in, in a video. And then we're going to go the running back two and the wide receiver two in a video. We're going to keep going down this sophomore class because this is one of the most exciting classes we've seen in quite some time and I was like I need a name for the series and you guys dropped some good comments down below some of them are some of them were pretty funny some of them you could have kept that shit to yourself but my two favorite were hindsight is 2020 you get a little you know you get to look bike on it you say hindsight but you also get to use 2020 so I thought that was creative and then you have softy seconds which is more probably on brand because we like to talk about sex here so softy seconds sloppy seconds and we're talking about sophomores so it kind of works so I haven't chosen which one I like more so I want you guys the audience right now to decide what you want the name of this series to be. It's either going to be Softy Seconds or it's going to be Hindsight is 2020. Whoever gets the most votes down below. Actually, I think I could put a poll or a voter thing on top of the screen. Otherwise, drop a comment down below. Whoever of the commenters wins that competition, wins that poll, is going to get a free draft guide. BDGE.store. The draft guides are available right now. Season long for pre-order. The season long rankings will be dropping sometime next week. So with all that being said, we are moving on to the running back two and the wide receiver two in this sophomore class. If you want to see the ADP of everybody from paid leads, Leagues. The link will be right down below to go to Underdog Fantasy to their app. You download it and you can see their ADP. So the next actionable steps. Tuck your shirt in. Stop yelling. Let's eat. And again, this series, we are breaking down two players in each episode, a running back and a wide receiver in the sophomore class. And this is per ADP, average draft position right now. These are not per my rankings. These are not some subjective kind of bullshits right now. These are per ADP in paid leagues on underdog fantasy. We went Jonathan Taylor, who's the RB1 last week. Today's running back, we are breaking down. This might be the most important video I make this summer because we are claiming our ground right now. Cam Akers, ADP of 10.4. Running back two in the sophomore class, running back eight overall, 10.4. You are using your first round pick on Cam Akers. There is no room for error when it comes to Cam Akers. However, however, with Cam Akers, he, in my opinion, is the most likely candidate outside of the very obvious ones, outside of the Christian McCaffreys and the Saquon Barkleys and probably the Derrick Henrys to finish as the overall RB1. What does it take to do that? It takes a lot of things. It takes a lineup, a plethora of different statistics and different situational beings for this to come to light, okay? We're on some alien shit with Cam Akers, but I think he has everything. You can check off every part of the list to make the argument that Cam Akers will be, I should say could be, the RB1 overall this year in fantasy. And if you own the RB1 overall in fantasy, you're probably at worst taking home second place prize money. So when we look back at last year, 2020, his rookie season, it took him forever to get going. Some of it was due to an injury. You know, he got some mojo going and then he got injured and then shit went back to a timeshare between Malcolm Brown and Darrell Henderson. Some of it was just Sean McVay being a fucking annoying little prick that he is. But over the last six games of the Rams season last year, Akers' volume went dumb. It went numb. It went dumb. The volume went higher than Vince Wilfork's order at a fucking Whataburger. When you look at the games, weeks 13 through their divisional playoff game, okay? I know the playoffs are not involved in fantasy football, but I'm trying to get a predictive measure of when the games count, what we can be looking forward to for the future. And you look at this chart, week 13 through divisional playoffs. He played in six games. He missed week 16 per game numbers, okay? That's the middle row. 
And then you look at the 16 game pace. I know it's 17 games, but we're all going to take a little bit of getting used to seeing 17 week numbers going on. So per game stats over those six weeks, Cam Akers averaged 22 carries, 93 and a half rushing yards, three total touchdowns, 2.3 targets, opportunities, 24.3 opportunities per game, total yards of 118. Fantasy points in half PPR, 15.8 last year would have ranked RB6. And then you could look at the 16 game pace, man. He was on a 16 game pace over those last six games of almost 1,900 yards from scrimmage. Are the targets where we want them to be? Are the touchdowns where we want them to be? No, but that's all going to be reconciled with what have changed in LA this year with the Rams. First of all, Malcolm Brown is gone. Malcolm Brown being gone is really, really important because Malcolm Brown was much more involved than I think people realize. Eh, people realize it last year because he pissed everybody the fuck off. You know, when Malcolm Brown gets you going, when Malcolm Brown is the reason that you're fucking Arthur fisting all over the place, things need to change. Malcolm Brown led that backfield in targets, receptions, and receiving yards. He also took 101 carries, 19 of them being red zone carries, nine of them being goal line carries. There are so many valuable touches to be had by Cam Akers. So you're talking about the guy who led the team in targets, receptions, and receiving yards, gone. That's for Akers. Red zone carries and goal line carries, gone. Maybe not all the Akers, but a lot of those are going to go to Akers. The other obvious thing here is Matt Stafford coming to town. That is huge, huge for the offense, right? It's huge for the receiving part of the running back game, okay? Because you look back at Stafford and what he's done in his previous tenure in Detroit. And he's sneaky. Lo you know, we talk about Rivers. We talk about Drew Brees. We talk about all these quarterbacks that love to dump it off the running back. How about Matt Stafford? We never talk about Matt Stafford throwing to the running backs consistently. They put up some, some fucking gaudy type numbers and they're catching from Stafford. If you look back just at last year, man, Swift as a rookie was on pace for nearly 70 targets. In 2018, which was Stafford's last full year playing 16 games, he played eight games in 2019, so I don't want to look at those numbers. But you look at his last full year, 2018, Detroit running backs combined for 140 targets. And then it's basically theoretic from 2017 through the, his lifetime contract with the Lions like 10 years back. 85 targets in 2017, 92 in just 10 games in 2016. Stafford is going to throw the ball to the running backs and throw the ball to the running backs a lot. And Akers is a good pass catcher. He's a very athletic running back, all right? So don't let the 2.3, 2.5 targets per game deter you from taking him. He's not a Derrick Henry type guy. He's not a guy that's not going to catch passes. He's going to catch a ton of passes, getting passes thrown to him from Matt Stafford. And when you look at when Gurley was winning fantasy leagues for people a few years back, right, he was seeing like 90 plus targets per season. Those are the numbers. I don't think, I don't expect Akers to get up to that number, but Gurley's nothing special on the receiving front. If McVeigh did that with him, he'll do it with Akers too. Will there be a bit of a split between him and Darrell Henderson? I mean, minorly, yeah, sure. But to be honest with you, I was way more worried about Malcolm Brown because Malcolm Brown takes those annoying, valuable touches. He's the one who's going to vulture you on the goal line. He's the one that's going to be on the third down uh, situations because he's because because Sean McVay can trust him and he'll block and he'll do all the right things. But that means if he's in on third downs, he's taking pass catching situations. OK, the other big thing that's going really, really overlooked with Cam Akers situation this year is the L.A. Rams offensive line. They ranked fourth in run blocking per PFF. That was right behind Indianapolis. Check this out because Jared Goff was their quarterback in LA last year. Teams were stacking the box against Akers. When you look at Akers' player profile, average defenders in the box against Cam Akers. Fifth highest number in the NFL. Stacked front carry rate. 36% of the time he took a carry, he was seeing a stacked box. Eighth highest number in the entire NFL. Base front carry rate, number six. Light front carry rate, 61st. He never saw light fronts, okay? Now, you bring in Matt Stafford, who's got a big arm. You bring in Deshaun Jackson. You bring in Tutu Atwell, guys that are speedsters and will spread the defense around. These defenses ain't going to be doing that shit in 2021. Again, Cam Akers has a very, 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 very real possibility of becoming the RB1 overall this year in fantasy. I'm not saying it's likely, but it's very, very real. The upside is very real. And if he drops into the second round of your draft, he's an absolute, the easiest smash. I know in uh, underdog ADP, which is the sharpest ADP on the web right now, he's at 10 and a half. But I think in most normal leagues, in most work leagues, in most friends and family leagues, Cam Akers will probably drop into the second round. That is where you hit that fucking button and you break your laptop hitting draft. You just check the boxes, man. You have an athletic running back 
who has breakaway speed and Cam Akers. He has size to be a three-down workhorse. Now the opportunities open up with Malcolm Brown gone. You have a very good quarterback. You have a very high-scoring offense now. You have a very good offensive line. There are not a lot of flaws to the situation that Cam Akers is in right now. And you just look, again, over the last six weeks of the season, I know the volume was high because they didn't trust Jared Goff, but if the volume goes back to Matt Stafford, a lot of those are going to are going to end up being pass-catching situations for Cam Akers. And Malcolm Brown, out of the situation, Darrell Henderson got like no run last year. He was getting carries of like two, one, three per game when Cam Akers took over in that backfield. I haven't done my season-long rankings yet. They're probably going to drop in a week or so in the draft guide on bdge.store. But I'm a little nervous about just how high I'm going to have this dude ranked. And it's going to be very, 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 very high. Okay. So Cam Akers, the RB2 in the sophomore class per underdog ADP. Let's switch gears, move over to the wide receiver two. And that is CeeDee Lamb of the Dallas Cowboys, currently going off the board as the wide receiver 14, 37 overall. So that's the 401 first pick of the fourth round. Lamb was just the absolute goat coming out of college. He was he was basically last year's Jamar Chase, where he was the consensus number one. You know, you had a couple guys trying to get cute and be like, oh, Jerry Judy's route running was fucking whatever. Same thing with Devonta Smith. But you're taking Jamar Chase, the wide receiver one this year. You were taking CeeDee Lamb as the wide receiver one last year. And Lamb was absolutely fantastic as a rookie. Most importantly, most importantly, that was when Dak was under center. So if you look at the splits, you have the five games where Dak played and that shit was real. That shit was real on the left side. You see CD Lamb averaging nearly six receptions a game, 17 PPR fantasy points per game, eight targets a game, 87 receiving yards per game. If you look at those splits, if you pace them out to the full 16, right, if Dak never got hurt, you're probably looking at something like 125 targets, 93 catches, 1,386 receiving yards, six and a half touchdowns. He had at least 59 receiving yards in all five games with Dak. And after he was gone, he had 59 receiving yards in just three of 11 games. So Dak under center is going to be the key to this offense and the key to a guy like CeeDee Lamb. The way he was used last year in this offense was uh, actually really, really interesting. They used him exclusively in the slot. He had the second most slot snaps, 621 slot slot snaps last year in the NFL. Only Anthony Miller had a higher slot rate than CeeDee Lamb's 93.2% of the time. So 93.2% of the time, CeeDee Lamb was lining up in the slot. They also used him in the screen game a ton, which I thought was really, really interesting. He had 16 screen targets, which was tied for eighth most in the NFL. I like that they're getting him involved there, right? When you have a guy like CeeDee Lamb, who's ultra talented with the ball in his hands, who's going to catch pretty much everything thrown his way, and just an overall playmaker, when you give him those easy targets in the slot, in the screen game. It's just easy, easy fantasy points. So I do give him a little bit of bump up in a PPR league as opposed to a half PPR or standard because they're not giving as many downfield shots. But this offense is going to, I mean, guys, remember back to last year when Dak was on, Dak was like legitimately on pace for like 6,500 passing yards. Dak and Cooper and Gallup and Zeke and Tony Pollard and moving and their offensive line will be healthy again. They're not the elite offensive line they used to be, but that's just more hurry up. That's just more quick hitting shots to CeeDee Lamb. That's more quick hitting screen plays to CeeDee Lamb. Lamb's price is very high right now. He's already the wide receiver 14. And it's one of those situations where everybody wants to be ahead of the curve, right? The market clearly would rather be early than late on him. And I, you know, I can't blame you because a guy like CeeDee Lamb has the potential to bust out and go for 1400 yards and 10 touchdowns. And by the time he does that, you can't get him next year at a reasonable price. Cooper right now, Amari Cooper is the wide receiver 11 at pick 34. So he's going three spots ahead of CeeDee Lamb. And I think the real argument obviously becomes, do you take Cooper or or do you take CeeDee Lamb? And when you look at the first five games of the year, I want to break it down between CeeDee Lamb and Amari Cooper with Dak Prescott under center. Amari Cooper leads him in targets, 53 to 39. Receptions, 39 to 29. Receiving yards only by nine yards. Fantasy points, CeeDee Lamb actually topped him and fantasy rank over those first five weeks of the season. CeeDee Lamb was a wide receiver 11. Amari Cooper was a wide receiver 13. So Lamb actually edges him out in fantasy points. But in a five-game sample size, someone has a focus drop or someone like trips on the field or some shit, that's going to move you from wide receiver 13 to wide receiver 9. So I'm not really too involved. I don't really care about the fantasy points overall. Like when you look at what's really important, like the opportunities and the targets, it was it was all Amari Cooper. I just think you look back at like Dak and Amari Cooper. They've had the chemistry since Amari Cooper has come over to Dallas. Remember when he was traded like halfway through the season, had some monster, monster games, and they had the full year, and now they have the first five games left. Like, I just think that, that, that built-in chemistry is there on the outside, taking more valuable shots downfield. I think Cooper is still very much the wide receiver one there in Dallas, and I would probably take him over CeeDee Lamb. That being said, if you're on the turn, if you're on the turn of that 3-4, right, you got the 3-12 and you got the 4-1, I don't think the stack would be terrible because you could probably get Dak on the on the 5-12-6-1 turn as well and just fucking 
stack up all the Dallas Cowboys. And again, remember that that team was on pace to throw for like a bazillion yards when Dak was under center. Uh, it's extremely high paced. It's, it's going to produce a ton of fantasy points in a division that's going to produce a ton of fantasy points between the Dallas defense and the Philly defense and the Giants defense and Washington's obviously extremely stout defense. But most of the time, you know, you get two games against Philly, you get two games against New York, and then the rest of their schedule is pretty fucking easy from a passing standpoint. So this offense should just be humming again. There's a possibility that maybe in full PPR, I would lean towards Lamb because he is going to get a lot of those easy screen targets. And at the end of the day, I I, I don't know if Lamb's necessarily going to be a guy I'm targeting everywhere, but I'd probably split the difference at the 312-401 price. So he's, he's definitely someone I want shares of. He's not someone I'm going out of my way to target. He's not someone that I'm fading in particular, but wide receiver two, sophomore class, pick 37, 41 sounds about right. So that's going to wrap up the second episode of Hindsight is 2020, Safi Seconds. Y'all let me know. Comment down below or answer the poll from the beginning in the video. I don't I don't know what actually ended up happening. We'll figure it out once everything is edited. I will see y'all tomorrow. Make sure you subscribe if you want everything fantasy football during this offseason. Go cop the draft guide, bdge.store. Go download the Underdog Fantasy app and come draft with me. Underdog Fantasy, link will be down below. Use promo code BDGE. When you deposit 10 bucks on Underdog Fantasy, they're going to give you $25 on top of that to play with. And I'll see y'all tomorrow.